My engagement with interfaith dialogue began in the 60s as a consequence of a visit to the Jewish community in Berlin. To cut a long story short, this led to encounters with a number of German pastors and eventually to a Catholic conference center called the Hedwig Dransfeld House in a little town called Bendorf on the Rhine in Germany. It had been founded by a Catholic women's movement and after the war was directed by a remarkable woman called Annalisa de Bray. She had set about making the center into a place of reconciliation, arranging conferences where German and French and German and Polish families lived together for a fortnight. Her wish to meet European Jews to take part in a conference between Israeli and German young people led to my visiting the center and an immediate rapport with this remarkable woman. The result was the transformation of the house's annual Catholic Bible Conference into a Jewish Christian Bible Week. Over 40 years later, it remains unique in many ways. The post-war German Jewish community was very small, and such dialogue programs as existed meant that a Jewish speaker would visit, give a lecture, and leave. Here, for the first time, we spent a week living together, studying Bible texts, and participating in each other's services, though it took many years of experimenting for the full pattern of the program to emerge. The effect for the duration of the week, in effect, for the duration of the week, we created an interfaith community made more real by the presence of families with children. Looking back on the beginnings of the week at the 40th anniversary celebration, <clears throat> I spoke about the three dimensions I felt were present and whose relative significance changed over the years. There was the Jewish Christian encounter that made the Bible week possible and probably necessary as well, as Christians tried to come to terms with what was seen as a disastrous failure of the church during the Nazi period. There was the Jewish German encounter, highly problematic and at times deeply painful, as we Jews and Christians alike became witness to a deeply felt sense of shame and guilt. And thirdly, there was the Hebrew Bible itself, the official catalyst, and through its treasures of stories and the richness of shared Jewish and Christian interpretations, an open door to any number of steps to understanding. The details of the evolution of the Bible Week would require a full lecture, but I want to introduce another encounter that was to affect my own subsequent development. My teacher and colleague, Rabbi Lionel Blue, was the initiator of a new dimension. He had come to know Winfried Mechler, a German pastor who was then working in London at the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Church. A disciple of Bonhoeffer, Winfried belonged to the Confessing Church, which had been established in opposition to the Nazi supporting German church during the period of the Third Reich. In discussing what the church might offer to the Jewish people beyond the preoccupation with the past, the idea emerged of the need for establishing a dialogue with the Muslim world. The idea had already been mooted by Rabbi Dr. Leo Beck, the spiritual leader of German Jewry during the Nazi period, who had survived Theresienstadt concentration camp. Already in a presidential address to the World Union for Progressive Judaism in 1949, he had spoken about the fact that Judaism and Islam were now neighbors. Uh, he wrote, today they are almost compelled to face each other, not only in the sphere of policy, but also in the sphere of religion. And there is the great hope that they will behold each other and then meet each other on joint roads, in joint tasks, in joint confidence in the future. When Pastor Mechler moved to Berlin to the Evangelische Academy, together with Rabbi Blue, they began a series of conferences for the three so-called Abrahamic religions, and in the process created the Standing Conference of Jews, Christians, and Muslims in Europe, JCM. Again, the history is developed in the thesis by Dr. Kirpler. In 1967, I was in Israel studying Hebrew in preparation for entry into the Leo Beck College to begin my rabbinic studies. The Six-Day War was the last occasion when I put my medical skills to work in Hadassah Hospital. The following year, I attended the JCM conference in Berlin. 
During one of the sessions, we were asked why we had decided to participate in the conference. A young Egyptian man said that his brother had been killed in the Sinai Desert during the Six-Day War. The silence that followed his remark was electric. But he went on to say that if no peace resulted, then his brother had died for nothing. So that was why he had come to this conference to meet with Jews. This was such an extraordinary reversal of every assumption I had come to expect and a moment of personal transformation but I found myself feeling the need to match his commitment. And this memory has sustained me over the many years of sometimes difficult interfaith work with Muslims. In the subsequent period, we decided that an important step would be to create an opportunity for the future spiritual leaders of the three faith communities to meet during their years of study so that they could bring this personal experience of what came to be called trialogue into their subsequent work. The actual development of the annual International Jewish Christian Muslim Student Conference, again JCM for short, took many years of experimentation to develop. Again, it was hosted from the beginning uh, by uh, Annalisa Debray at her center in Bendorf. Though it was easy to provide rabbinic students from Leo Beck College and Christian theology students from the UK and Germany, the third equivalent partner hardly existed in the newly emerging Muslim communities in Europe. However, by opening the conference to community and social workers and teachers, it became possible to ensure equal participation of the three faith communities. From the beginning, however, all the planning was done by an equal number of representatives of the three faiths, so as to model the kind of shared activity, mutual trust and respect we wanted to promote. One other set of decisions was important at the outset. We were aware that these conferences took place against the background of the conflicts in the Middle East. So a conscious decision was made to restrict the themes to those directly affecting our respective communities in Europe. Topics included the impact of immigration to the West, especially the potential conflict between the generations as children are raised in a very different environment from their parents. Issues like intermarriage, the challenge of multiculturalism to personal identity, the impact of secularism on traditional religious or A central aspect of the conference was group work with lectures restricted to three, one from each of the three faiths. The speakers were invited to focus on a common problem so that we were looking together in the same direction and we learnt about our differences as a side product of the process rather than being directly confrontational. Inevitably, the events in the Middle East had their effect in any given year, but we tried to evaluate them in terms of their impact on our European communities. Again, the presence of families with children ensures the experiencing of the human dimension in all aspects of the encounter. More than 30 years after its inception, the JCM Student Conference remains at the cutting edge of such encounters. In the past 30 years, any number of initiatives have been developed to further develop amongst the three Abrahamic faith, uh, dialogue amongst the three Abrahamic faiths. Some arose as a reaction to Samuel Huntington's A Clash of Civilizations, others to counteract the waves of anti-Islamic feelings triggered by 9-11. One example, the International Council of Christians and Jews introduced an Abrahamic forum into its program. We are clearly in the middle of a major re-evaluation of the Western relationship to the Islamic world, which is itself undergoing enormous cultural and political changes with their inevitable impact on the nature and forms of the faith itself. Large Muslim diasporas in the West are having to adjust to a very different intellectual and spiritual environment while experiencing at the same time the dangers of a growing Islamophobia and racism. In some ways, those in the Muslim European diaspora are facing similar challenges to those faced by Jews in the wake of the emancipation, a medieval religious system facing the challenges of modernity and an immigrant community trying to find an appropriate way of conforming to the expectations of Western society while preserving their own unique identity. Both of these tasks are addressed 
in an unwelcoming and often hostile environment. One Jewish response was to develop a new concept of rabbinic leadership. The Talmud scholar and religious judge of the past had to acquire a more pastoral role and a set of academic qualifications to complement traditional forms of learning. In part, these changes came about from within the community itself, recognizing the need to communicate religious values to generations growing up with a Western education and increasingly alienated from the tradition. But this internal need was also a response to pressures from the governments of the time, which exercised control over the training of Christian religious authorities. Most of the great European and American rabbinic seminaries were created within a 50-year period from the middle of the 19th century. Today, we are seeing the same issues affecting Muslim communities throughout Europe under the banner of promoting a, quotes, moderate Islam, close quotes, in contrast to the perceived Islamist threat. Government-sponsored programs are being promoted or introduced in the United Kingdom, France, Holland, and Germany, and probably elsewhere as well, to develop local training programs for imams, most of whom are currently imported from the home country of the immigrant community. These newcomers often have little grasp of the local language or culture, thus reinforcing the alienation of the local home-born younger generation. Though there are many disagreements about what is meant by moderate Islam, and whether this kind of program is ultimately helpful, it is also supported from within the Muslim community, as was similarly the case for the Jewish community. To return to a final aspect of my personal history that is relevant for this paper, having graduated as a rabbi from Leo Beck College, I was invited to return there to teach Bible and subsequently became principal. Throughout my time, I promoted an interfaith component into the rabbinic program. For example, it has been an important principle that any formal teaching about other faiths at the college should be done by someone within that faith rather than by a Jewish expert on the subject. So we have regularly had Christian and Muslim lecturers on our faculty. The principle is that the personal experience and commitment behind what was being taught was an essential factor. Though such a concept may not be necessary within a purely academic framework, it takes on particular significance within a religious seminary program. I have discussed the implications of this openness in my book, Talking to the Other, Jewish Interfaith Dialogue with Christians and Muslims. Uh, here are a few conclusions I drew from the perspective of a Jewish seminary. The presence of Christian students at the college means that a discourse that in the past has been held totally within a closed group is now being observed by someone from outside. Moreover, that person belongs to a faith community that has often been the other against which we have defined our own selves. Suddenly, all the simplistic comparisons are no longer available, in part out of respect for the guest in our midst, but also because our own errors, projections, fantasies, and misinformation can be instantly corrected. In many ways, this is healthy and invigorating once you have recovered from the shock. <laughs>